behalf of the Carnegie Council, I'd like to thank you all for joining us on this very rainy night. Our guest this evening is John Judas, and he'll be discussing his latest book entitled The Nationalist Revival, Trade, Immigration, and the Revolt Against Globalization. Just as his previous book, The Populist Explosion, helped us to understand the forces that swept Donald Trump into office, The Nationalist Revival provides a deeper understanding of why us versus them nationalism is coming back with a vengeance. In the next 30 minutes or so, John and I will have a conversation about this phenomenon. And in the end, I believe you'll have an understanding of why having a new and different conversation about this issue is so important. John, in your previous visit to the Carnegie Council, February 2017, you majestically helped us to understand how populism was affecting elections around the world. It's now, 22 months later, <clears throat> excuse me, and it appears that your focus has shifted from politics to governance. So why the pivot? Well, because all these um, uh, <coughs> governments have uh, changed, and uh, particularly ours. I didn't, I think when I was here, when, it was before the election. No, it was February 2017. Really? It was after? <coughs> right. The populism yeah. was big at that time, and it was just yeah, exploding well, here. And, Europe and it, it can put it this way it continues to be big and uh, I had I um, w what I was looking for was a certain a underlying aspect of populism and you know in other countries where it's not a matter so much of populism um, Hungary Poland Eastern Europe they have different political traditions than the political traditions that I talked about in the populist explosion which were most which were countries that had long-standing democratic traditions. Right, but why the pivot? I mean, so why are you now focusing on nationalism? Well, I had to do another book. I, I know, but, <laughs> but, it, but it seems like... I mean, like, I'm an old guy, you know, I got... The right, I know, but first, but, but it was politics, and now it's sort of governance. I mean, you know, you're talking about the way these right. populists are governing, so maybe you could, ex, you know, explain a little well, bit about that. Well, I think that... I mean, the difference for me in discussing nationalism and discussing populism is that uh, nationalism has a deep psychological dimension yes. that populism doesn't necessarily have. Obviously, it comes out of people's minds. But uh, na nationalism is a kind of so social psychology. It's right. based upon sentiment. Uh, it it uh, you know, goes back to... Uh, the beginnings of humankind, um, identifying with somebody beyond yourself, beyond your family, then beyond your tribe, beyond your kin group. Uh, so there's a there's a deep sense, sense sentiment that underlies nationalism. I mean, the thing that that struck me in thinking about it again was that you really you, you really can't uh, begin by typing it as something coming from the right, which is what we came to think of it after World War II because of the Nazis and Mussolini. Uh, nationalism was thought about as something very bad. And you know, when I was doing the populist book and, and I was in Europe, for instance, the Danish party wouldn't describe themselves as nationalist because that, was a, uh, that, that would conjure up the memories of Hitler. Well, again, in the United States, we have a different kind of view of it, and it is a more neutral view. And what I see is underlying that sentiment, that the sentiment itself is the basis of many of our institutions. You can't have, for instance, a democracy without a common understanding of a we. And that we involves you're giving power, you're ceding the vote, you're allowing people to determine your fate that you've never seen before, that live, you know, a thousand miles away from you. That's, that's essential to the idea of democracy. And it's framed within a nation, within a we are all Americans, we are all France. But it's become, let me just stop, it's become more difficult to define who we are as a nation now because there are so many different identities and it sort of has right kind of, yes but 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 let me let me just go on for a moment because then I can come to that if you think again of the modern welfare state or of social democracy in Europe 
That involves people's willingness to pay taxes. I'm going to pay my taxes to support some guy who's disabled in Orlando, Florida, or some woman in Reno, Nevada, who's just lost her job. Now, I've never met those people. So the whole idea of a modern welfare state, again, is based upon this sense of a common nationality. When that starts to break down, when you have people saying, uh, well, these people aren't really Americans. They don't really belong there, but we're paying taxes to support them. And they're voting, but they shouldn't be voting. When that happens, then obviously it's happened in a lot of uh, countries in Europe. Or when you have a sign of separatism where people say, well, we're Catalans, we're not really Spanish. Spanish. Then democracies, then nations begin to break down. And you know, we're at sort of in the beginning. We're seeing that those fissures, and they really began in the United States in the 80s, and they, they're increasing, and we have this sense of a breakdown. And the breakdown, again, is a breakdown of this common nationality, of this we. Um, well, we are commemorating the end of World War I, where you know, fractious nations and power plays came into being. And it was hoped that at the end of World War I and at the end of World War II, that this would sort of end all this fractious nationalism. So do you think we're returning to that again today? And what um, do you see happening down the line? Well, the, you know, there was a, uh, with the end of the Cold War, right. 1989, and Berlin Wall, uh, there was a certain utopian feeling that uh, swept the, the world the kind of, in our country. Uh, the idea that we were a kind of unipolar world, uh, the United States is a dominant power, but also uh, what would happen would be that we would have a, a liberal, demo liberal democratic capitalist world. And a lot of the institutions that were created, the dub World Trade Organization, for instance, the European Union within the framework of Europe, uh, were based upon this, uh, this hope that we would kind of universalize liberal capitalist democracy, that we wouldn't have the kind of problems that we had World War I and World War II. And obviously, we're returning to a situation where we do have a very fractious situation with, among countries, uh, not necessarily leading at this point to war, but leading to the kind of rivalries and discord that uh, we didn't expect, let's say, in 1993 to be occurring. So if we're moving away from this internationalism, is there something um, that is constructive that can replace it in some way so that we won't divide into fractious groups fighting one another? Well, look, I'm not a, uh, I'm not a seer. And uh, I can't tell you how, the, uh, how it's all going to turn out. Um, I, I can, I, what I understand better is why there is this kind of uh, discord internationally. Uh, we, it's very hard for me to understand, for instance, how we're going to rebalance our trade relations in the United States. Uh, Trump is obviously doing it, and he's doing it in a very awkward uh, um, uh, way. But some, you know, something has to be done. But I don't have to, I'm not going to be able to sit here and tell you how we can do that or how we can finally resolve the problems about climate change. I mean, there are a lot of problems that can only be dealt with internationally by countries ceding a certain amount of sovereignty to other countries. Uh, climate change being an obvious pandemic, so nuclear proliferation. If anything, we're going in the opposite direction right now. So I can't, I, I, again, I'm not, okay, so I'm not going to be able to tell you what okay. in the year 2030 it would be like or to prescribe exactly how we're going to be able to put, put all these things together. So nationalism in times past has shown to be left wing as well as right wing. But why today is nationalism seem to be coming mainly from the right? OK, well, yeah, just to, again, just to make this point clear, because this is how we start, start off with. Um, Lincoln was a nationalist. Theodore Roosevelt, Winston Churchill, Charles de Gaulle. So it's not all, uh, it hasn't all been Hitler and Mussolini. Uh, 
anti, uh, uh, anti-colonial revolutionaries were all nationalists. They were binding together a nation against an oppressor. What we have now for the last 20 years is primarily uh, nationalism on the right. Uh, nationalism directed at what um, Muslims, um, illegal immigrants, you know, Mexican rapists, um, refugees, what have you. Uh, the, uh, again, that's where the us versus them breaks, br has broken down. Um, why has that happened? I mean, I, th there are several reasons. And just, just bear with me, because it will take a few minutes. Please. Uh, um, and, and it goes back again to the, to, to the uh, failure of the kind of utopian designs that come out of the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, when this uh, fairly pacific and prosperous uh, world order that we build after World War II uh, begins to break down and we try to replace it by something else. Uh, first of all, uh, on the economic front, Bretton Woods, international monetary system based upon the dollar. Uh, countries have to uh, uh, get approval if they're going to have large devaluations of their currency. They control uh, corp uh, other companies uh, leaving their country to invest in other, in other countries. In other words, move capital moving from one country to another. They control what happens to their currency. That begins to break down 1971, Nixon, Nixon administration. And uh, what, what replaces it is a kind of world order, the underlying assumption of which is something like this, that what uh, the economist Adam Smith in the 18th century hoped for in the na national economy would occur in the international economy. That is to say, if we remove all these barriers, trade barriers, barriers to currency speculation, barriers to corporations moving wherever they want in the world, you would get a kind of uh, prosperity where each actor, economic actor pursuing his or her own self-interest would result in the better, best interest of everybody. And what's happened, really, is that, that uh, there has been a rising standard of leveling in the world since the, since the 1970s, obviously. And countries like India and China have arisen, um, the Brazil, lot, lots of countries have prospered during this era. But something else has happened. First of all, much greater economic instability, financial instability, beginning in the 1980s, just a succession of financial crises that culminate in the Great Recession and continue to this day in Turkey and in Argentina. So that's one thing. The second thing is within the countries themselves, there's greater inequality, and that includes China and India, as well as the United, obviously United States and Europe. Now, if we're looking at politics and the political effect of this, one of the things that happens as a result of this is that uh, you get this new order based upon the kind of Adam Smith assumptions, breaking down all these barriers. But not all the countries play by the same rules. When we wanted China to join the World Trade Organization, the assumption was that it would become eventually like us. I mean, we always have this kind of view ourselves that we, we can mold the world around our own image. And the idea was that it would also become a liberal capitalist country. Same thing about uh, Russia in the mid-1990s, uh, when a lot of American advisors went in there to, uh, to consult. Now, that, that didn't happen. And uh, w what happened instead was uh, the rise of these tremendous uh, trade imbalances uh, between China, the United States. In Europe, the dream of the Euro and the Eurozone doesn't produce equal prosperity among the countries. But in fact, the exact opposite happens. You had a division between the North prosperous, South in trouble. And that continues. 
So you have these kind of divisions. Now, the groups that are most affected by, by this process that goes by the name of globalization uh, are many of the workers in the, and we're talking here again about the United States and Europe, uh, who made things, manufacturing, mining, who lived in small towns, medium-sized towns, in the United States, in middle America, the South, uh, in uh, England, in the Northeast part, in France, in northern France, in Vienna, outside, in Austria, outside of Vienna. And these people who were most seriously affected by the kind of instability and hollowing out created by globalization become the base for right, both right-wing populism and nationalism. The, the uh, Br British sociologists call them the left behinds, and that's a, that's a pretty good term. They're not necessarily people who are, uh, you know, in, impoverished. They're not, uh, they're not on, the, on the street uh, with a tin cup, but they're people who've lost their expectations about the future and who feel that they have somehow been left behind, that their way of life has been endangered. So that's, a, that's where, that's the relationship between the, the economics of the last 20, 30, 40 years and this kind of rise of right-wing populism and nationalism. And that's now, where immigration fits in as well. Yes, a that's a, you're, you're doing a good job because that's the next subject because you get, this is the group, this described, the left behind, but the issue that animates them above all is immigration in both the United States and in, in Europe. And, you know, in the United States, again, beginning in 1965, for humanitarian reasons uh, in, and not really for business reasons, uh, we change, for civil rights, we change our immigration laws. But built into that is family reunification. So over the last, you know, 50, 60, 70 years and accelerating after 1990 when we changed the law, a tremendous number of unskilled and low-skilled workers enter the country, and they put a lot of pressure below. They bring a lot of cultural clash because they don't speak the same. They don't necessarily speak English. Uh, they demand social services, uh, certain kinds of industries like meatpacking and construction and janitorial get transformed from mid-wage unionized to uh, more low-wage uh, non-union uh, jobs creating a tremendous amount of tension. A similar kind of thing happens in Europe with this idea of the single Europe where you have workers from the less developed parts of Europe going from Poland or from Hungary, uh, going, going uh, to France, the U UK, Germany. So that you have those kind of tensions created by immigration. Now, Add to that Islamist terrorism starting in the early 1990s and then, of course, 9-11. And, you know, again, in the last 20 years, uh, or since 9-11, more probably in Europe than the United States. So that it becomes not only an economic issue, uh, an issue of culture, but an issue that we're letting in some people who are going to blow up a shopping mall. You get that kind of combustible combination and you get the, the right-wing populism and nationalism. And the primary group that it appeals to, again, are the left behinds, the people created by these eco economic uh, forces uh, over the last uh, 20, 30 years. So it's a, it's a kind of, it's a kind of pe people always you know, debate this thing, is it economics or is it culture? It's both. And it's people who feel their way of life is threatened. Is there ever a way to keep the destructive potential of nationalism in check? Well, look, let me just, let me talk for just a second about, the, about why there's a clash in the United States because you're, or in Europe over this kind of nationalist politics, what it, what it involves, because then it'll be easier to talk about how, how to keep it in check. Um, it, you know, be, I would 
bet, right, that the people here are not uh, Trump nationalists, right? You're not all America first people. You know some, maybe, you know, 40% of you are, right? No, I know, I'm just kidding. The, what, what you get in the modern economy, in this kind of post-1970s economy, uh, is a division, a social and geographical division. Uh, where you get extremely prosperous metro centers, but largely finance, electronics, high tech, uh, and at the same time, uh, small towns, mid-sized towns, Hazleton, Pennsylvania, Erie, Pennsylvania, Akron, uh, that are suffering. Now, think about the people who live in them. And think for a moment, let's talk about the people who live in the metro centers, like New York City, San Francisco, Washington, D.C., where I'm from. Um, David Goodhart, this British uh, uh, journalist, has a book called The Road to Somewhere, and he describes the difference yeah. between somewheres and anywheres and trying to explain Brexit. And I'm going to put that in terms of nationalists versus cosmopolitans. Now, cosmopolitans in the United States aren't people who were disloyal to the country, uh, who hate America. I mean, there are always people like that, just like there are you know, people who still might belong to the Ku Klux Klan. But we're not talking about the, the extremes. Uh, but there are also people who have many different associations and interests and identities. They're a university professor. They're a, a, they have a medical practice. Uh, they belong to clubs. They have a family with kids who were very successful. They have many different kinds of identities to fall back on in addition to that of the nation. Now, if you go for a minute, if you shift from you know, Washington, D.C., and you go about 700 miles to the west, you know, you'll run across towns where people did once have a very clear identity. They worked their lifetime for a certain corporation or business. They belonged to a union. They lived uh, mostly in cities, not in suburbs. They had a corner bar. They had their teams, and so, et cetera, et cetera. Now, what, what's really happened and what's created a lot of this division, social and cultural division, is that for people like that, the nation becomes all important. It becomes much more important than it does for the, the uh, un univer let's say, for the university professor at NYU or what have you. And for those people, it becomes a kind of be all and end all. When the guys, uh, you know, the NFL guys don't kneel at the foot, uh, uh, don't stand up for the national anthem, that's a really big deal. They're not going to watch the, the game anymore, even. It's a, um, uh, other things that don't, again, that don't make sense, I think, to cosmopolitans, but that, that are very important to the left behinds. Guns. You know, I, I, did a, I spent an afternoon in a suburb of an industrial uh, town in the Midwest uh, interviewing uh, Trump people. And I don't do these focus groups, you know, where you have a list of questions and stuff like that. I just let people talk for, and we just talk for, for you know, a, a long time. And I was amazed how much guns came up. Now, you know, why is that? They, you know, they want to go hunt. There were not that many of them were hunters. Guns is part of the home. It's part of the safety of the home. It's being able to protect your family. It's a way of life, again, that uh, they see as under attack. It's a part of their identity. It's a part of what, it's, what it is to be an American. Religion, the same thing. So you have this kind of com complex of values, of sentiments, that are very important to people, but aren't necessarily as important to other people. And what, what's happening now in politics and what, what worries me a lot is that among the, let's say, cosmopolitan group, there, there's a kind of uh, Manichaean dismissal of these people. You know, they're all, e we're getting around to your question. They're all right. evil. They're all white supremacists. But in fact, you know, again, 
Uh, people are complex. There's a lot of different sentiments swirling around us. It's not, uh, you know, you, you live in these fancy places. You're not immune from the same kind of occasionally racist thoughts uh, or, or any of these various things. So it's some of these people voted for Obama in 2008, 2012. It's a question of what comes to the surface at a particular time. What sentiments are, so, are aroused? Trump's brilliance was exactly dramatizing those particular sentiments, that there's a threat to the way of life. It doesn't have to be that way. There are, again, there are economic issues. There are different issues that people appeal to. But uh, again, I, th I think that, that what's happening now is that we have a politics that really is divided, very divided on a cultural level. And it's hard to see the differences. But, but the, it, I think it's very possible to break through them. It's just, again. Well, you know. that's the main question. Is yeah. there any prospect for reconciling these two visions of America, Trump's and cosmopolitan's? I mean, I think that's what we're all well, sort of wrestling with. Yeah, sure. I mean, the. There is a very basic issue that of Americans feel about economic security, and you know it doesn't matter whether you again live in live in Akron or you live in uh, now, Silver the, Spring. With the market starting to go down in the last two days, do you think that's yeah. going to change the right? And balance? I mean, even if you look at the dynamics of this election in the last uh, oh two or three months. In the beginning of the election, when the Democrats were really doing well, and it looked like the Democrats might take the Senate as well, the health care thing was really coming to the surface. And it's still very important. Because right. that's an issue, again, that cuts completely across. Uh, now, unfortunately, what we're having is we're going to have another election that's about Donald Trump. It's going to be, a, I think, a rep right. it's going to repeat. Uh, the 2016 the election, on him. and it's going to be a, a, about either how wonderful or how egregious he is. Uh, and I think the Democrats will do a little better this time because uh, particularly women voters are going to be much more in an uproar than they were in 2016. But it's still not going to get us to a point where we can break through and where we, we can start to recreate the kind of social coalitions that we had you know, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, between the bottom of society and the middle of society. I mean, the Democratic Party today really looks a little like an hourglass. You know, they got poor minorities and the poor. And again, obviously, a lot of minorities are middle class, upper class. But again, a concentration of people at the bottom and then upper middle, a very strong among the college graduates, and particularly people with advanced degrees, professionals. Uh, and a lot of the middle, what used to be the base of the Democratic Party, has gone over to the Republicans. So we have this weird kind of clash in the country. And, the, and that's, the, uh, that, that's the really the, the problem we have politically. And from my standpoint as a Democrat, the key is to try to bring back the middle. Right. Well, before we open it up, I just guess the central question is then whether the current trend is actually just a democratic recession from which the world will eventually recover, or whether the forces visible today will strengthen and threaten liberal democracy as a form of government in more countries. What you mean, what will happen in the future? That's right. It's whether or not, you know, this is just sort of a blip on, you know, the historical trends or you know, how do we repair what is sort of chicken? I don't, I, I, I wish I could say it was a blip. Now, the, if you look at uh, Europe and the Euro, I, I'm really pessimistic. I'm not an economist that they're going to be able to put it together. I think that there's so many restrictions that having a common currency puts on the poor countries in terms of being able to devalue their own currency and get out of these kinds of situations that um, we're going to have conflicts uh, continuing. Now, they may come from the left as well as the right, and they certainly did during the uh, Great Recession in Greece and in, uh, in Spain. But I, I don't see that genie, I don't see how that genie is going to be put back in the box. I don't think that that's going to be resolved. And uh, I, I worry about China and the United States. I mean, one of the things that uh, 
that struck me in, try, in doing this book was the, uh, the, the power of nationalism. And, uh, you know, I'm a, I was uh, raised economically at the, at the, uh, in the school of Karl Marx. And, uh, you know, we, basically we don't th think, of, we think of economic forces as being fundamental. But look, if you look at what happened with Russia, for instance, uh, the Russian Empire, the Soviet Empire, falls apart. And uh, we think we can put it all together. And, you know, and then they make this kind of promise, Baker and Bush, to Gorbachev that we won't move the NATO eastward. And in fact, they do it. And you see it's just a complete resurgence of, this, of Russian nationalism. There's no, you know, there's no mystery to why we have uh, Putin. He didn't, uh, you know, he didn't come, come from nowhere. And we have a re recurrence of the, some of the similar tensions that have existed uh, for 60 years or so. Uh, people have a certain vested interest in their nation and in their nation doing well. The, the analogy I use is, um, is sports. Now, you know, I'm a Cubs fan. And when the Cubs win in the summer, I go to, I go to bed happy. When they don't, I'm very unhappy, and I'm very unhappy now. But there, there's a certain part of me that lives or dies with the team. You know, they talk about Giants fans. What they say, the New York Giants, if you bleed blue or something like that, those are, that, there's something to those metaphors. It's life or death. It's your identity. Your immortality is vested partly in the nation, in, in that identity. So it's very important for countries, and it's been the basis of a lot of wars and divisions uh, for centuries, thousands and thousands of years. And uh, again, as, as I look upon the China-US thing, it worries me. You know, e e if you really want to see uh, conflict, again, China, Korea, uh, and, um, and Japan, I, um, maybe I could say this even though it's in tape, but. I was doing uh, interviews in Japan, and uh, I didn't want to use this in my book, but, uh, and somebody was translating for me, with me, and it was with a prominent professor in Japan. And we got to, we were talking about um, the current conflicts with China and with Korea. They have uh, over, still over World War II. And he start, he referred, he, he referred according to the translators as, the Chinese and the Koreans as assholes. And I said, well, I mean, is this, a, <laughs> I checked back again, is this a correct translation? There's a lot of hostility there. Uh, Pachinko, do you read, any of you read that novel? It's a wonderful novel. And you see, again, the basis. So there's a lot of national, nationalism is very important. Now, obviously, we can temper it. And that's the goal of having uh, some kind of international uh, organizations. But, but again, I, I would worry with, to, I mean, tr there's two sides to Trump. Trump is not really a warmonger. I mean, I think he learned something from uh, the Bush and the Iraq war that it doesn't make much sense to start these uh, wars where it's not directly in Amer America's interest. But at the same time, uh, he really has, uh, if I can use this distinction, uh, you know, Hobbes versus Locke, uh, Locke, uh, everybody, uh, bound together by a social contract. Hobbes, people are very naturally uh, competitive with each other, and you need a monarch uh, in order to uh, keep the lid on the pot. Uh, Trump's vision is much more Hobbesian. Conflict going on all the time, and the United States standing up for itself, and not having, in that sense, real allies or friends. So his vision and his politics are very much antithetical to the kind of international agreement we need to be, to be confident that we wouldn't get swept suddenly into a war, say, on the Korean Peninsula or, war, or in the Middle East with Iran. But at the same time, I don't think he is a, I don't think he's a, he's, he's not a Hitler. He's not, he doesn't see uh, military glory as the, uh, you know, as the be all and end all of a nation. Well, on that sober note, I want to thank you once again, <laughs> you know, for giving us a better understanding of what nationalism is. And 
I just like to open the floor to questions, and I ask that when you go to the microphone on either side, that you just identify yourself before um, we recognize you. Thank you. Thank you, James Starkman. Uh, I'd like you to comment on a labor costs and globalization, and it's very, it seems to me there is an interplay between those two factors, nationalism, the blend of communi communism and capitalism, which was so successful to bring China up from, from uh, nowhere to where they are today. Just how do you see, is this an evolving, constantly evolving structure between these different factors? Well, I, again, with the labor cost thing, you're, you're, you're not talking to the, uh, somebody from the IMF. I'm not, I'm not an expert on these matters. Uh, I, I think the thing that, that I would worry about is the race to the bottom that is occurring. In other words, companies leaving one country, or one region for another region or another country because of uh, labor costs. Now, you know, in the United States, there are certain kinds of commodities like T-shirts and things like that that are going to be made overseas. That's, that's settled. But again, uh, if you look at our, our, our balance of trade with, say, China and other Asian countries, computers and electronics are big in terms of trade deficit. Well, you know, those are things that we could make in America, uh, but that are going overseas to a great extent because of labor costs. So labor costs is an issue. Um, the other issue that's related to it is taxes. Uh, there's a tremendous pressure, again, to, to lower particularly business taxes uh, competitively, and Trump has fallen into that. And what that means, basically, is that uh, it's a threat to the modern welfare state, because you don't have the uh, money, again, to support the population. So you have uh, a, si a situation where you might have uh, firms becoming more profitable, but where the profits themselves are going into stock repurchases or what have you, and not into the public welfare. And we increasingly have that situation. They, they're starting to have that problem in Europe as well as in the United States. Don Simmons, uh, one, of, one of the tropes of the Trump administration has been the, um, the desire to um, withdraw from uh, agreements and other foreign entanglements, and it has led us to uh, uh, along a path of acting alone. Uh, the right-wing pundits refer yeah. to that as recovering our sovereignty, even when talking about commitments freely entered into and so on. To, how does that desire for the United States to act alone, uh, how is it related to uh, populism? Do you think the, the members of Trump's base really don't want to be in international organizations or treaty agreements? And, and going well, on further, would it be, could you see, even a few years from now, a Democratic president restoring and, and re-entering these agreements without running into howls of outrage from Trump's base. Right. I, that's not just the, Trump's base also. The uh, question of foreign aid has always been controversial in America. And, and unless an administration uh, can show that it's in, directly in the national interest uh, to spend money, uh, then it's uh, going to be unpopular. I mean, th this was a problem after World War II. and, and uh, that Truman and Atchison faced uh, in 1947, 1948, when they wanted to send money to Greece, you know, to Greece, to fight the insurgency there. So we're going to have this problem with us for a long time. And Trump, again, in the wake of of uh, the Iraq War, I think has a lot of credibility in saying that we shouldn't get involved in foreign entanglements that aren't directly in our, our interest. There's a, uh, a passage in uh, Woodward's book, Fear, where they're debating um, Afghanistan. And you, you know that uh, a, a lot of the sort of the portrayal of the book is that the, there were these, you know, the ad, there were the adults and then there was Trump, the moron. 
But if you read it, actually, Trump was asking a lot of the right questions. Why are we there? We've been there so long. We haven't gotten anywhere. Why are we spending all this money on it? Whereas, again, the American military's impulse is always you know, more and more until we can finally resolve this thing. But there's no, no resolution in sight. So again, given that background of our current, in, of our current interventions, it's all the more harder to make an argument for international organizations. I, in, you know, just one other thing. I mean, the NATO thing, for instance. NATO, fight the Soviet Union, Cold War, central to it. Was it 1949? Uh, the, the Cold War ends, and we still have NATO. And not only NATO, it starts expanding. Um, why? What's its purpose? What's its point? Now, I'm not telling you here that it, that it doesn't have a point that you can't, but it's not clear. And in those respects, uh, Trump sort of acts like the man in the street and uh, a kind of common sense, whereas the, the Washington establishment, all the policymakers, you know, it, it just won't even entertain questions like that. But, but they have to be answered, and they're not being answered. Jim? I was happy that you ended on the non-material causes for nationalism, because I think it's very easy for us to reduce everything to uh, economic change, in part because it's easier to think of answers. So when you think about these other things that you were talking about, the sense of resentment of cosmopolitans, uh, anger at the elements of globalization that have to do with new people, Immigrants, immigrants, refugees, and so forth. Make sure you talk up a little. You're, What's that? Just talk up a little. That's oh, I'm sorry. When you when you when you talk about the these I issues of globalization that don't have to do with with economic causes, right, right. Uh, but with uh, things like the globalization of people, immigration, uh, right. refugees. What do you think uh, that? Uh, what do you think can be done, if anything, to bridge the gap? between uh, what you might think of as an increasingly globalized, cosmopolitanized world and the enormous number of people who, as you say, feel left behind, not just economically. Well, he, he, you're asking for my political program, right, for America? Yeah, but I mean, without having a bunch of bullet points. I mean, in some broader no, no, sense, I know, are, I these know. Things, I'm just tell you. are these things addressable? Yeah. The, the, uh, the, when you think about what's happening with immigration in the United States, you have to think about the 19th century. Uh, we've had crises over immigration in the 1840s. We had an American party that called the Know Nothings. Um, from 1880 to 1920, just straight conflict from then on over immigrants. And uh, so, you know, call, call, Cultural assimilation doesn't come that easy to the United States. The, uh, say, you know, ethno-racist legislation in 1920 and 1924 and 1929 that restricts immigration, and in both in numbers and in who gets into the country, uh, in an odd way becomes a blessing because it gives us a kind of breathing space to assimilate. It also uh, was one of the reasons we had unionization in the, in the 1930s. Because if you think about it, uh, at a time when the economy is in trouble, is not necessarily a good time uh, to organize uh, uh, unions. But well, we also didn't have a tremendous labor surplus at the time. So it turned out to be OK. So again, it's, we're, we've had this experience before, and we've had this tremendous wave of immigration from 1965. It's gone from like, what, 4% to 13% of the population. I'm not unsympathetic to the idea of a breathing space in two respects. More priority on high-skilled rather than unskilled, uh, and maybe even going from like, let's say, a million two to 600,000 a year, something like that. I, so I think that, that's, a, I think that that's, that's important for the process of assimilation. The, 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 the second thing is the issue of economic security. I, I don't think we're ever going to get around uh, to, the situ to a 
point where we have 2% uh, unemployment every year. We're always going to have, and, and I don't think we're going to be able to av avoid recessions. But we have to rid Americans and rid ourselves of the kind of everyday anxiety that we feel about health care, about education, educating our children, about our old age. Uh, we have to do some of the same things that the Europeans did uh, 50, 60, 70, 80 years ago. Uh, so that's, and that's an important element. I think that'll change the country. The, the last thing I'll say is that, that, one of, that, that one of the things that was most uh, mistaken about the kind of utopian economic ideas in the 90s was that instead of uh, believing that we should, uh, that we were going to convert the Chinese or the Koreans or the Japanese into liberal capitalist countries, we should recognize that some of what they do would benefit us in terms of industrial planning, in terms of developing advanced manufacturing in the Midwest and in many of these areas now that, uh, that, that are, are uh, virtually ghost towns. So again, I th I'd say those three things. Now that, that would be my platform for uh, America. I'm Helena Finn, and my question has to do with uh, nationalism in Europe. Uh, the current administration has been actively supportive of right-wing groups, very friendly to right-wing groups, Nigel Farage, for example, uh, in Germany, the Alternative for Deutschland, and former administration official Bannon has even gone out and been talking to all these groups my question is, first of all, how would they think they could form a movement of nationalist groups when they're absolutely going to define themselves separately from one another rather than as part of the European Union? But my more important question, thank you for what you said about Locke and Hobbes. That was very, very, that was <laughs> okay, a I'm good a clarification. Former philosophy graduate How does student, this so. possibly benefit us? That's my question. Which benefit us? You mean the Bannon stuff? Uh, no, I mean the support for the, uh, you know, the support of this administration for the right wing in Europe. How does that benefit us? How, encouraging Brexit, you know, it's happened now, or it's well, about to be finalized. Well, I mean, the, I have a question whether the Bannon project in Europe can work, because there's a lot of differences among those nations. For right. instance, right. Poland is very, very worried about the Russians. Hungary and um, Italy, the League in Italy, mm -hmm. are very pro-Putin. So, so there, it's no, not like I, you have a common uh, politics. I agree there. with you that it can't work. By its nature, it's compl the idea of creating such a movement is flawed. My real question is, why, are, why would they be doing this? And you know, what, how could this kind, fomenting this kind of thing, how could it possibly yeah, You mean, why us? are they under this illusion that it would work? Yes. You know, you should uh, <laughs> go back and look. I was doing this recently at, at the statements that uh, American lobbyists and American officials made in the, uh, in the late 1990s about China when we were doing uh, permanent, the permanent uh, trading thing as a, mm -hmm. as a prelude to championing them in the WTO and what mm -hmm. was going to happen to China. And, what kind of country it was going to become. So, you know, people foster illusions. I, I was a revolutionary from 19, what, 66 or so to 1976 when I gave up the gun, you know, and uh, <laughs> we, we thought uh, I, I was, uh, I, I uh, was writing for a, the New American Movement uh, newspaper and we had to end up uh, every, every article by saying that the only real solution was socialism. So, you know, people have illusions, and they have illusions that they're going to cre create a global movement. But I think I don't. I don't think it, it's going to happen. Yeah. I mean, the one you know, the one area where they really have uh, developed uh, uh, the allies, and I, I told myself never to talk about this after writing a book on Truman and Israel, is the Middle East with uh, this guy from Saudi Arabia, Net Net Netanyahu. It's a nightmare, you know, and that and uh, the uh, hostility towards Iran, 
Uh, there we could really get into trouble. That's. Diplomat, so I believe in balance of power. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's what. See, I thought what would be consistent with the Trump uh, foreign policy, if you thought of what a what that what a kind of realism would be, would be offshore balancing that we would sort of you know be friends and enemies with all these people, but not get involved. But in fact, in that region, we have gotten the we haven't gotten we've already gotten over our heads as the recent events in Turkey with the journalists getting. Probably getting hacked up, though we don't know. Yeah. Um, oh, yes. Thank you, Ron. Ron. Yeah, thank you, <laughs> Ron Berenbaum. Uh, first of all, uh, just a historical comment: uh, the National Labor Relations Act excluded agricultural workers. Right. Uh, without it, you probably never would have gotten the. Southern votes in the uh, in the Congress uh, to pass that act, and of course, uh, that that created a a limited group of empowered people. That that was a good thing, but it left uh, it left a lot of people out. Uh, secondly, I would say that uh, immigration does not. Uh, threaten these people, or these people's jobs particularly. Uh, it is automation that does. And that is what is hollowing out the factory towns. That is what is creating uh, globalization, which, by the way, uh, has, I think, in the last decade, uh, pulled some six billion people out of poverty. Uh, so that in terms of global stability, uh, nothing beats globalization. And you really have to uh, do everything you can to keep those prices down, so that uh, those labor prices, so uh, the people that are complaining can still afford to buy their shirts at Walmart if they were made in the United States. Uh, they couldn't, and uh, everything uh, to keep uh, prices, uh, you know, at a point where people can afford them. I mean, just one of the more interesting <laughs> episodes in my life is uh, whenever uh, I'm overdue on my credit card, which is all too often, uh, I used to get uh, calls uh, from uh, Bangalore, a uh, city I know well. But I seldom do anymore because uh, Bangalore has become uh, too expensive, and now they're coming uh, from the Philippines. And so is this is question? not something you can put a stop to. I, I don't see an alternative to globalization. I don't see uh, a solution. I think, more, I think there's got to be more acceptance of it and a creation of uh, new kinds of... Uh, uh, occupations and uh, managing new kinds of machines and automation because otherwise uh, I don't see any uh, solution. Uh, Is there a question that no, you No, I get it. I sort of like okay. it. I'm, I'm, looking, I'm, I looking, got it. I'm looking for a non, you know, oh. a non immigration focused solution. That's what I'm looking for. Okay, I, I got it. Uh, so look, there, there's. Uh, I, you often hear this argument: what's the uh, what's the basic cause? And usually, it's not immigration versus automation. It's usually China versus uh, and runaway shops. You know what runaway shops are? Is this not a foreign phrase? Co companies that go from north to south or out of the country in order to uh, get lower wages and less regulation. And you know. Uh, Again, beware of uh, unicausal arguments. Uh, both are involved. Uh, the the uh, economists from MIT, what their estimate was, 2.4 million factory jobs were lost to chi Chinese competition in, uh, you know, from whatever 2000 to 2014. So it was substantial. Automation also a factor. Uh, immigration. Again, what, what you see most is, again, at the lower levels of the economy, not necessarily. I, I did do, I was thinking about this as I was coming to New York. 
I did a story for the American Prospect that I originally wrote it for a business magazine that went out of, went, went out of business about a uh, Kawasaki factory in uh, Yonkers that started and that um, the, they, they had black uh, la, uh, employees that, and the Teamsters wanted to come in and unionize and they fired all the employees and brought in Korean immigrants. So, you know, it does happen. And there's industries uh, like meatpacking that, again, used to be uh, unionized that aren't. And, and uh, I always remark upon these, uh, you know, the political reporters go to Iowa and they discover these uh, small towns like where, you know, this guy, Steve King, he's a, you know, he's a, he's a raving nativist. But, you know, he represents a part of Iowa, again, very important for meatpacking. Uh, used to be uh, fairly prosperous. Um, a lot of uh, those plants now uh, to immigrant and illegal immigrant labor. Uh, low wage now, not mid wage. So you know, certain industries did get transformed. Not you know, again, not uh, not necessarily uh, autos and auto and steel. So it's all three. They're all uh, factors. Uh, the thing that you know, I, I I wrote about this in an article for the American Prospect that. The, one, of the, one of the very odd things about American politics is probably the group that got mo, mo, most damaged, in a sense, by the low-skilled low immigration from the South was African Americans, particularly in Southern California. Um, there's, there are studies of this, and the Civil Rights uh, Commission in 2012 did a study. But it's not, again, it's not an issue, and if you look at polling, um, there's the African Americans are not necessarily uh, militant on the issue of immigration, but that is an that, so low skilled those kind of jobs yes very much uh, automation I'm for automation uh, but again if we have automation we're going to have a larger economic surplus and where is it going to go who is going to use it will it how much to what extent Will it, will it accrue to the nation itself? And that's where the, the nationalism comes in. Hi, uh, Alex Timoza. Um, I'm very intrigued by um, your uh, discussion so far. And I want to ask a question just to piggyback off what Ron said in terms of the automation. And because I hear there's, well, I don't hear, I see that there's a growing movement right now in regards to the universal basic income. I'm not sure if you're familiar about that, but it's... Uh, I've heard of it. Yeah, there's uh, <laughs> it's the notion of uh, basically allowing people to give in them $1,000, doesn't matter on your social economic status, race, ethnicity, whatever, everyone will be getting $1,000. It's going to cost about $1.5 trillion, and it's supposed to be cost effective. They're already trying it out overseas in Europe. And my question is basically, do you think that will help reshape the economy, you know, that they're... A lot of low-skilled jobs, as you say, are in danger, and um, people need to find a different way of contributing to society and the economy. So my question is just, do you believe in it, and what, what are your thoughts? And do you think there will be enough pushback from either a, a specific political party? Do you see it gaining more traction right. in the United States? And the the former uh, owner of the New Republic, uh, who caused me and you know, 15 other editors to quit. Chris Hughes, a Facebook billionaire, uh, wrote a book uh, proposing the uh, universal basic income. So I'm familiar with it. Um, y you know, y y that kind of approach is not going to fly in America. Uh, the Protestant ethic is very much, again, part of our basic idea of what it is to be an American. Uh, to, to be an American involves working for a living. And uh, that kind of proposal is just going to awaken all the problems about uh, freeloading and stuff like that. On the other hand, you know, again, universal health insurance, there are all kinds of things you can do that are the equivalent of a universal basic income. But the idea of handing out money like that, you know, Nixon and Mo Moynihan uh, had a certain version of that in 1970. Um, but I, I, don't, I don't see that as, as uh, coming about in the United States. And I think that it's, it's not the kind of proposal that the left itself should uh, bank, bank upon. 
after this discussion, it just makes me wonder if nationalism serves any other purpose other than to inflame its citizens. You know. But at, that, at this point, I know there are still questions, but the time has come to an end. And I want to thank you once again for giving us a better understanding. And I'd like to invite you all to continue the conversation. And have a good. Thank you for coming. Well, you always are provocative. And huh?